Okay, we'll call the meeting back to order. Okay, citizens time. Community involvement is an important component of all, any excess, successful school division and the school board welcomes public input. Please be respectful of all speakers and limit your comments to three minutes in matters relating to personal or personnel issues cannot be discussed. And we have a list here and the first on the list and if you could come up to the podium and introduce yourself and your uh, magisterial district, that'd be great. Judy Olson. Hi, my name is Judy Olson. I'm from the Marshall District. I'm here tonight on behalf of parents, students, and teachers who are concerned about the impact of our early school start times on the health and academic success of our teens. I'll give you a brief overview of sleep facts based on information from the Mayo Clinic, NIH, the Sleep Foundation, and numerous other major medical resources. Research shows that adolescents need an average of nine hours of sleep per night. With our 7.30 a.m. start time, they would have to be in bed and asleep between 8 and 9 p.m. every night in order to get the recommended amount. Based on what we know about our own kids' schedules and habits, we estimate that they're getting an average, the majority of our students are getting an average <clears throat> of six and a half hours of sleep per night. A survey, of course, would give us more concrete numbers. <clears throat> it's scientifically documented that during puberty, a teen's sleep and wake cycle naturally shifts later as melatonin is released closer to 11 p.m. at night, giving them more of an 11 to 8 a.m. sleep and wake cycle. In their 20s, that starts to shift back to an earlier release. We also know that sleep deprivation is linked to obesity, increased substance abuse, depression and anxiety, poor memory, poor decision making, diminished motor skills affecting response, response times in things like driving and athletics, inability to stay focused, and mood swings. I only have three minutes, so you will have to review the more extensive information contained in the packets that we've prepared for you and will give to you tonight. There you will find not only the most major scientific research from the Center for Applied Research and Educational Development at the University of Minnesota, which was a three-year study following 9,000 students in eight high schools over three states as they moved to later start times. That study showed increased academic performance, fewer car accidents, and overall better health. This, the packet also contains information on school systems that have made changes to their start times and how they've done it, information specific to Fauquier County, potential next steps, including a survey and a copy of our PowerPoint presentation. Over the past nine months, a group of us have worked through the mountains of research on sleep and adolescence. We've looked at what other school divisions have done. We've put together a presentation and your packets and have made presentations to and talked with students, parents, and staff about what we have learned. During these presentations, we've heard from parents who support this idea, from parents who came in against the idea but changed their minds after seeing the presentation, and we've heard parents say that they now realize that they themselves need more sleep. We've also heard from some who are against it or hesitate to support it, many of whom have students at Marshall Middle School, which currently operates on the elementary schedule, as you know. It's notable that they are vocal about their concern at potentially having to start earlier because they start at 8.30 as opposed to 7.30 now, and they know firsthand how beneficial that later start is for their children. Do I need to stop? How much more do you got? Just go ahead. We will continue to educate the community on the importance of sleep, especially for our teens. However, we would like to see you, the school board, support the idea and begin the process of looking at the reality of changing start times. Currently, 72 of 95 counties in Virginia have high school start times of 8 a.m. or later. That number will very soon be increasing as Manassas City will start later next year, Fairfax County in 2015, and Richmond is also looking at later start times for 2015. This is a growing trend around the country, and almost daily another school division makes the headlines because they realize the importance of such a change. Secretary of Education Arnie Duncan has tweeted twice this year about the importance of sleep for our students, and he would like to see more school systems move to later start times. This is real, it's not going away, the movement is growing.
Based on significant scientific data, our adolescents' need for additional sleep in the morning is real, and a shift in start times for our middle and high school students is needed. In the words of Theodore Roosevelt, the best thing we can do is the right thing. The next best thing you can do is the wrong thing. The worst thing you can do is nothing. Please, let's, do the, let's not do the worst thing. Let's move this forward. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay, Diane Searles. And yes, I am Diane Searles, and it appears I'm in the Scott Division or whatever that's called district. Um, I'm against the later start time for high school, and um, I don't disagree with what she said, that yeah, we all need more sleep, because I myself could use more sleep. I don't know of an employer who says, that's fine, you can come in an hour later because I know you went to bed late last night. Um, kids could go to bed earlier. I have two high school students that lights are out in my house at 10 o'clock. I started with them at the age of two with a bedtime. If you give them a bedtime and they understand their homework has to be done before the other stuff, they don't have to be up till 11 and 12 o'clock at night doing homework. They could actually get it done before then and go to sleep. Turn off the computer, turn off the cell phone, turn off the TV, whatever it is that's keeping their mind wired. You could just read a book to put yourself to sleep. It can be done. Um, yeah. If the school didn't dismiss at the time that they currently do, and I believe the game plan was to switch it till four o'clock for high school. I don't know where that leaves middle school students, if they would also have to be that late, but bear in mind that if you have to pull your child out for a doctor's appointment, like the dentist and the orthodontist, who you have to go at their schedule, not your schedule, every tardy goes against their record. And nobody wants to be pulling their kid out during instructional time, including hopefully the school board, well, what are you supposed to do? They gotta get their teeth straightened, they have to go to the dentist, they have to go to doctor appointments. Living in Fauquier County, you can't get to a specialist right around the corner for a 4.30 appointment. That's just one little side point to doing this. If they had it for, let's say, sporting events, kids don't get out till four o'clock. Well, that means those buses are being used to transport those kids. I'm very fortunate that I am a minute and a half from the high school. My son can be home in five minutes. Some kids have a 40 minute drive on the bus. So if their bus is used for an after school activity, such as a sporting event in Fredericksburg, let's say, by the time that bus finishes dropping somebody off in the plains and can get all the way back to Fauquier or Kettle Run or wherever for a sporting event, they're gonna miss the first half of that game. Football is the only sport, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, that is only on weekends. I believe every other sport that we have has games during the week. If you have a four o'clock dismissal time, when do you do practice? When it gets to be into the fall and you're losing daylight and you don't even go out for practice until 4, 4.30 in the afternoon, you're losing your daylight. Unless they're gonna put lights in on all the practice fields, you're cut off. And if you have to get JV and varsity, oh, that's right, maybe they won't have JV practice, but that's not fair to those students that didn't make varsity practice either, or varsity team. Um, shoot. So you all wrap it up? Do I have to stop, or can I say one more thing? You can say one more thing. In the real world, we go through school. Fourth and fifth grade, they're getting ready for middle school. Middle school, they're getting ready for high school. High school, it's all about getting ready for college and the real world. The real world boss is not gonna let you come in late. You have to get up early because of where we live unless you're fortunate enough to work for the school system or maybe something else close in town, you've got one heck of a commute. You have to get up early. These kids have to understand that's the real world. Yeah, nobody wants to get up at six o'clock. I don't like getting up at six, but that's the way the real world works. Okay. That's Thank my you. piece. Thank you. I don't disagree that we need sleep. I just disagree with how
Okay, thank you. And if anybody speaking doesn't really get to the end of your comments, go ahead and, and give your comments to Ms. Callahan here, and she can make sure we see the full bulk of your thing, because it is sometimes hard to get through in three minutes. Patricia Baker. Madam Chair, School Board, Dr. Jack, good evening. Hi. <laughs> I'm going to kill my three minutes. <laughs> um, I am Pat Baker. I'm president of the FEA. And for the last time, um, I'd like to address the board. And thank you very much for what Dr. Jack has reported as possibility of improving the employee's bereavement plan. The policy for bereavement leave is something that we um, very much appreciate. We thank you. And also, Dr. Jack has told us that because we know that our bullying policy is in compliance to, to the best of our ability right now, and rather than change it twice, we know that you'll be looking at it again in the fall and making it a more comprehensive plan for everyone involved, and we thank you for that. And the only other thing that I tell you before I tell you who our new president is, is that um, in the beginning of the school year, Dr. Jack said just, he just said he would be interested to know about teachers working above and beyond the contract time for schoolwork, and, and that it means just paperwork, schoolwork, planning at home. And in the survey that went on through the year, we had 25 people who consistently responded every month. We had five middle school, 10 high school, and 15 elementary, which makes a good sampling, but not a complete one. And in that time, we found that, of course, the elementary teachers who probably have more paperwork and more planning for um, a more content-driven curriculum, uh, various different contents. We found that the average time, when you put it all together and take the ratio of the number of teachers based on what was turned in, we found that the average teacher in Fauquier County is putting in 51.5 or 51 and a half hours during a week and take away our 37.5 contract we have an average of 14 hours above and beyond contract time each week that teachers give to Fauquier County students and school board. And it's just an interesting fact that we just thought you'd like to share. The national average, according to 2013 national study, is 10 hours and 40 minutes. So we kind of exceed national average. That being said, I thank you for all the four years of dealing with the school board, hopefully, You've enjoyed me as much as I've enjoyed coming. And I would like to introduce um, Ms. Thelma Massey is the new president of the Fauquier Education Association. Thelma, you want to stand up? Ms. Thelma Massey. Thank you very much. And, and thank you, Ms. Baker, for all your years of service for our kids. Thank you. OK, Denise Sheffer. Good evening, I'm Denise Sheffer. I'm from the Scott District. I know several people that wanted to be here tonight but were not able to because of their children's graduations and other commitments. I know some of them have emailed you. Um, my older daughter wanted to come as well, but she's over at Kettle Run right now playing volleyball. I am here tonight to ask that you not take the school start time on as an issue as a school board. I think that you should be looking at more important issues such as retaining the best qualified teachers possible as well as bus drivers and other positions where we have had high turnover rates in recent years. I have objectively read the studies being put out by some members of the School Support Council and Sleep Matters Fauquier, and I am still not in favor of a later start time. I have a daughter in high school and one in middle school. One is a morning person and one is not. Neither of them want the start time changed. They both are very busy with school activities and travel sports, and are still able to get to bed by 9.30 most weeknights. There are only so many hours in a day, seven hours for school, two to three hours for homework, one to three hours for after school activities. You get the idea. By shifting the schedule to start later in the day, you would not be giving these children more time to sleep. You would just be shifting everything back to later in the day. I ask that you let the parents in the county parent our kids and ensure that they get the sleep they need, and I ask that you as a school board not take this on as an issue. 
rather that you focus on the academic needs of the children of our county. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Okay, Owen Sheffer. Hi, good evening. Uh, Owen Sheffer from the Scott District. Um, I also agree that the children do need sleep, but I also believe that this is a family parenting issue, not an issue that the school should be addressing. Um, people will talk about the circadian rhythm in our bodies. It is a rhythm, it's not a clock. Um, the body has a natural tendency to want to go to bed later and later and fall into that cycle of moving on. There's several simple steps we can do to get the right sleep, and these are coming from other medical studies. Uh, the Journal of Sleep, researchers have studied more than 15,000 kids in the U.S. ranging from 12 to 17. They said that the teens going to bed late were 24% more likely to suffer from depression than those going to bed before 10 p.m. <coughs> UCLA Sleep Disorders discusses that circadian rhythm as a 25 to 26 hour cycle versus our 24 hour day. Uh, they say that we need to resist the natural tendency to go to bed later. They say not going to bed at a consistent time can lead to sleep disorders and symptoms of those disorders include getting this difficulty getting to sleep until the late evening or early morning hours, difficulty waking in the morning for school, and sleeping very late into the morning or afternoon on weekends. These are all similar to issues to what people are discussing now. However, in the studies that you've been presented with, only 6% of teens have set bedtimes. So if we're not setting bedtimes for the children, they're not gonna fall into a, a cycle. The, also in the study, um, that teens basically were going to bed when they finished their homework, finished socializing, or playing video games, and very few reported having bedtimes. As parents, we should be enforcing bedtimes. Removing distractions. The study from the Mayo Clinic uh, on page 24 references distractions that most of our teens have in their rooms. 88% have phones, 45% with TVs, 41% with computers. Both Ohio State University Medical Center and the American Medical Association of Public published studies on the negative effects of such dim lighting emitted by these electronic devices. Not, noting in particular that artificial light disrupts the circadian rhythm, alters the body's natural hormonal responses, and continues continual exposure to this lighting from video games, TVs, and computers is disturbing to that rhythm, suppressing the release of the melatonin that helps the children sleep. Seattle Children's Research Institute shows that TV and video games at night can cause sleep problems. TV and video games act like jolts of caffeine. Rather than winding down, they act as stimulants and amp up the brain. Evening entertainment may also disrupt the normal nocturnal rise in melatonin. TV and computer monitors can keep melatonin levels from normally rising because of the brightness of the screens. Uh, consistent sleep habits. Um, other, plenty of other articles discuss the circadian rhythm and the importance of developing good sleep habits. They say having a routine bedtime of 10 p.m. or earlier, sleeping in a cool environment, turning off music, internet, and TVs. Resist, uh, um, would reset the body's rhythm. It also says that if a student is used to going to bed at 6.30 a.m., they shouldn't be binge sleeping on the weekends. Binge sleeping confuses the body. Many of us allow our kids to sleep until noon, late hours of the morning on weekends. That completely disrupts the same rhythms that we're trying to set. Exercise. Uh, so if you could just wrap up. Wrap up. Thank you. Last thing. Uh, several studies also include that regular exercise helps eliminate the sleep deprivation and several show that an hour of exercise each day helps the melatonin release 30 minutes earlier. So children who are getting more exercise, more involved in sports are gonna naturally wanna to go to bed a little earlier too. So I would also, I would just urge you to leave this to the parents to figure out how to get the kids to sleep. There are plenty of studies out there to show that children can sleep earlier if they follow the right patterns in their life. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, Helen Wurst. Hi, I'm Helen Worst, and I'm one of Brumfield's representatives to the Student Support Council. And I believe it's unfortunate that we weren't able to give our whole presentation, but I understand the um, constraints we have with time, but I really, really urge you to look at the entire presentation and our data. We've worked a long, long hours gathering this information, and we have it from very good sources. And I realize um, that the, uh, there's a, a lot of theories about the melatonin, but it is a biological fact that in teenagers, it does not kick in until around 11 p.m. 
And if you try to put your kids to bed earlier, they may get in bed, but they, it doesn't naturally kick in until 11. And if we wanted to start our kids at a time, I mean, if they had to get eight hours of sleep, they would have to push their bedtime back so far. I mean, how many kids go to bed at nine? And the physical effects that are found in the schools that's made the switch are really compelling. The physical benefits from the American Academy of Pediatrics in a school that um, uh, started at a later time showed a 68% less likely to experience a sports injury. And it was not dependent on how many sports the um, child played, the children played. And Stanford swim study had a, a 0.51 second increase in sprint times of a 15 meter sprint. That's huge if anybody knows swimming. 0.15 seconds quicker off the start time. And the men's basketball team had um, decreased um, uh, sprint times and they had increased percentage of ba um, shooting and free throws and in three points. And coaches have now adjusted their sleep cycles for those colleges for their teens. And there, the, one of the most compelling studies was done in Virginia Beach and Chesapeake because one county switched and the other didn't. There was a 40% decrease in car accidents. And that is just huge. I mean, the, um, there's also less obesity in the um, schools that switched. Increased participation in after school activities, all activities, sports. And they were, the uh, coaches were so surprised to see this because they really didn't think that would happen. They thought this was going to kill their athletics. And in the end, they were very happy with the change. But one of the most compelling reasons, I think, is the emotional benefits. There were fewer emotional outbursts, decreased incidence of bullying, decreased incidence of violence, including weapons, on a decreased um, anxiety, suicide, and uh, for every one hour increase in quality sleep, there was a 72% decrease in suicidal thoughts and an increase in positive attitude. Thank you for your time, and I want you to please seriously consider moving this proposal to the next level. At least allow our school administration to move forward and examine the impact such a change would have on our system. We already have ample scientific data to show that the impact on our children would be positive. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Laura Henson, is it Henson? Yeah. I'm Laura Henson, and um, my children go to Brumfield and to Taylor Middle School. I'm one of those parents who joined the Student Support Council, and Judy doesn't know this, but I was one that wasn't actually supporting it. Um, I wasn't actually against it, but I wasn't su supporting it either. Um, my children, we're lucky we live in town. My 13-year-old goes to bed at 10. He's sound asleep by 10.30. I wake him up at 6.30. He's able to eat, dress, be on the bus at 7.05. What I came to after being on this group was that I have done a complete turnaround. I'm not here to speak for my children. I'm here to speak to the other children who do have, um, who do not have that opportunity to get at least eight hours of sleep. What I found in, through transportation is currently with a 7.20 start time, we have children in our county getting on the bus at 5.50 in the morning. There are students riding the bus from six o'clock till seven so that they can get there in time to have breakfast. And, and to me, this was just mind boggling. I had no idea that children were being required to get up at five o'clock in the morning. Um, I read an article in the newspaper by Dr. Mike Amster. He is one of the members that uh, is on the health advisory committee. There were several things that he mentioned in his articles. One was about putting away the electronics. From all the parents that I have talked to, they are doing that. Parents are smart, they know. They are taking the electronics away at least an hour before bedtime. It also said to put the kids to bed earlier. I know that parents are doing the best they can with what they have. Unfortunately, our lives are in the evenings. My little boy plays Little League Baseball. He has a game up in Marshall, six to eight. The earliest we get home is 8.30. The earliest I'm able to get him to bed is nine o'clock. Luckily, once again, we live in town. We can walk to school. 
we make it doable. But there are also these students who play in high school who do not get home until 11 o'clock. They don't get back to the school until 11 because they're playing games out in other counties. They can't get to bed until 1130. So we are telling the, the athletes, it's okay to go to bed late, but you gotta get up in the morning with six hours, six and a half hours of sleep. But on all the other days, you need to go to bed by 930. I think this is unrealistic to ask our students to do this. Um, what I would like to say is I do think that parents are doing their end at the end of the day to help their children get to sleep. But what the school systems can do is start allowing these children the opportunity to have more sleep at the beginning of the day by delaying some of the school times. There's so, there is so much information out there, it was just overwhelming to me to find out um, how all this is supported, that they really do need uh, later start times. Like Judy said, 70 out of 95 counties in the state of Virginia, 72 do not start school before eight o'clock. That's 76% of the schools in the state of Virginia. I have a few pros that I would like to mention. Some of the are pros- they Are they quick? They are quick. Yeah. One of the pros is that Falkirk County uh, has a lot of snow days. With delayed school start times, I think that we would experience more uh, delayed starts. Instead of missing an entire day of school, we would, the VDOT would be able to clean the roads and the children would still be able to go to school and parents wouldn't have to miss an entire day of school. Um, like she, uh, Helen said, with the, the studies of the 40% uh, car accidents, I know that insurance companies give discounts to students who uh, make A's. There's no reason why insurance companies couldn't start giving discounts for students that go to school at a later start time. I think this would be financially beneficial. One of the biggest complaints that you hear from students or teachers is that students are falling asleep. And what I've heard from the elementary uh, teachers is that it's actually better for the little ones to go earlier because they're awake and by three o'clock they're tired. Um, there are many articles about job opportunities. Um, students wanted to have part-time jobs, but because they're getting up at 5.30 in the morning, they can't work. One of the kids that was totally against this found that once they changed the, to the later start time, he was able to get a job working from seven to 11. He was home in bed by 11.30, woke up at eight o'clock, got dressed and was at school and ready by nine o'clock. He's getting at least eight and a half hours of school and was able to work a part-time job two nights a week. Okay, if you, if you would give Ms. Callahan the rest of your comments and she can make copies for us so that okay. we could read all of it, that would be great. All right. Um, sure, thank okay. you. Thank you. Okay, is that everybody? Oh, okay. And, you're, and just announce your name and your magisterial district. I'm Megan Kelly, Scott District. I have a almost 13 year old at Auburn Middle School and a rising sophomore. And all of my children have always had bedtimes. They've always stuck to the bedtime. Although when the teenager became a teenager, you saw the change. I also was opposed to it when I first saw the presentation. I'm one of those moms who definitely want to get my kids out the door in the morning and get on with my day. Uh, however, I found the evidence overwhelming. Uh, I did a complete turnaround. Um, I understand as far as sleep cycles, I've seen it change in my household. Uh, 13 year old still, eight, nine o'clock, she's asleep on her own, don't even need to tell her to go to bed. The 16 year old, 10 o'clock at night, she's in there jibber jabbering, wide awake. Unfortunately, I also have the changing sleep cycle, so I'd like to be sound asleep at nine o'clock, which certainly was not a time of uh, my youth. Uh, also as an employer, I understand as far as you have work start times, However, as an adult, you choose what job you're going to take. And you do have some flexibility as far as whether you start a job that starts early in the morning. My guys have to leave at 3.30 in the morning to be on site on time. That's not something I would want to do. And that was my option. However, they accepted that. These students don't have an option. They're told what time to be there. I don't see why there would be a problem with moving forward. 
um, funding from the community if there is support. I do know that I know a lot of people who support it who are not here because they are working uh, and could not make it um, to see as far as how it could work into the community. Uh, we're not asking you to make a decision. We're asking you to move forward as far as researching it as an issue. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, announcements. Let me get down here to announcements. Okay, announcements. Beginning the week of June 16th, the school board office summer hours will be from 7 a.m. to 5 p.m. Monday through Thursday. The Mountain Vista Governor School Board will meet Thursday, June 19th at 8 a.m. in the Warren County School Board Office. Chairman's Night will be Monday, June 23rd at 5 p.m. at the School Administration Office, and there will be a special school board meeting and work session on June 23rd at 6 p.m. in the School Administration Office, or conference room. There will be a building committee meeting Thursday, June 26th at 8.30 in the school administration conference room. There will be a personnel committee meeting on Thursday, July 10th at 8 a.m. in the school administration conference room. There will be a finance committee on Thursday, July 10th at 5 p.m. at the school administration conference room. And the next school board meeting will be Monday, July 14th at 7 p.m. in the Falcon Room. And we all would really like to thank Mr. Burton and all his staff for everything you did to put together. Where is Mr. Burton? Is he still uh, here? Yeah. Oh, okay, he's thank back you so much to you and your staff for the reception and getting this room all ready for us today. It was great. Thank you, thank you. Make sure everybody in your staff knows. Okay, board reports. And we'll April. Part? And April okay, Ms. Oh, Plummer. and April Plummer, sorry. April, thank you for the re nice refreshments. Okay, board reports. Mr. Gord. Uh, I don't have anything to report at this time. Um, I'll just do a real quick, I wanna thank HR for a great retirement dinner. That was very good. Um, it was, it was very nice. And um, one quick update on, we had an FHS update meeting last week and um, work's going on right now. And as soon as teachers get out of here on Wednesday, um, Work's really going to start over the 300 yeah. wing, the 79 wing, yeah. and so they'll be ready. Yeah, in the parking lot. Yeah, so that's all I got. Okay, Mr. Well, Bland, you stole all of my thunder there. I had all, all of that written down. <laughs> um, just a couple of items here. I want to talk a little bit about um, uh, the Mountain Business Governor School. We are still in discussion referencing uh, opening enrollment to uh, 10th graders. Now there are a number of components that really need to be addressed before we move on that. And, and among them are the most important ones, budget and space. So uh, we, we're still in discussions about that. Nothing has been decided yet. Uh, let's see. There are options, one of the uh, other meetings we went to the other day uh, to discuss options that are being looked into referencing the Grapewood and Ringwood uh, roads, the ingress and the egress down there. In uh, front of Kettle Run. In front of Kettle Run, that's exactly right. Uh, some other options being discussed are um, better traffic control uh, for ingress and egress in the Kettle Run itself. So hopefully within the next month or so that we will be able to, uh, uh, to make some decisions after some further investigation as to what can be done to alleviate some of those issues down there. Okay? Did I miss anything? Oh, oh yeah. Uh, as far as personnel committee, um, there was not a personnel committee per se. We did have a joint meeting with the finance group and there are a lot of items that will be introduced tonight by Ms. Downs, I'm sure, so I'm not going to steal any of her thunder. So <laughs> you all have all of that information in your packet, but you will get a quick overview tonight of everything that we discussed. And all of this is coming from these two committees with recommendations for uh, moving on these things. Okay? Okay. Good. Ms. Reardon? to add other than to say that uh, it was great seeing everyone graduate congratulations again to the class of 2014 
and um, to all the principals, and uh, I hope everybody has a great, great summer. Dr. Jack? Uh, nothing, ma'am. Um, uh, I just want to reiterate what Ms. Reardon said. The graduations were absolutely outstanding. Um, I really want to hats off to Mr. Lee, Mr. Burton, and Mr. Warner for outstanding organization, and it, they were just wonderful. They were wonderful. Um, the other thing I'd like to ask the board, if we would take the later school start, start time to our next work session just to discuss it and see what we want to do with it. Is that something you guys want to do? We can, we can open discussion on it. Yeah. Okay, so if we could add that to our um, uh, work session on the 23rd, that would be great. And that's all I had. Is that anybody else? Anything else? Okay. Okay, Ms. Kotoff. You have before you the financial management report as of the end of April. That leaves us two months of operating and four months of salary still coming in. Um, we did receive our uh, state final appropriation based on ADM. We're slightly above. We are slightly trailing in our sales tax projection, but overall we'll be about even in state funding. Any questions? No. All right, thank any, you. But do you have any new information about the state budget crisis? <laughs> Only <laughs> that um, it looks you like they'll be calling a special session on Thursday, and it, they may go ahead and act on the budget that day. Oh. And the Board of Supervisors also will be considering appropriations that afternoon. Oh, that would be, okay, everybody keep your fingers crossed. I think we're going to get some good news this week. All right, that would be lovely. That would be lovely. Good evening. The following is a brief summary of the uh, occurrences in the Human Resources Department. Currently we have 38 certified vacancies that we are looking to hire for the upcoming 2014-2015 school year and we have 19 classified vacancies and on Tuesday, I believe it's July 17th, Right. We're having a uh, June 17th. June 17th. We're having a job fair at Liberty High School okay. for bus drivers, school nurses, school nutrition, and custodians. Cool. Any questions this evening? That's great. Nope. Okay. Nope. Thank We're you. Good. Thank you. Okay. Consent agenda. I'll move that the school board approve the minutes of the May 12th school board meeting and May 27th special school board meeting and work session. Payment of bills, personnel actions, literature elective textbook adoptions, superintendent's new evaluation instrument, and auto, automotive technology textbook adoption. Second. There's been a motion and a second that the school board approve the minutes of the May 12th school board meeting and May 27th special school board meeting and work session. Payment of bills, personnel actions, literature elective textbook adoption, superintendent's new evaluation instrument, and the automotive technology textbook adoption. Right. Is there any discussion? Yes, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Mr. Nick Napolitano, who has been selected as the new assistant principal at Liberty High School. Uh, Nick was amongst some outstanding applicants, but he quickly rose to the top. Uh, and Nick is coming to us from Fairfax County. at Aldrin Elementary School where he's currently a PE teacher, so we're really glad to have you. Welcome to Fauquier County. All right, welcome. Great, great. Okay, any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say no. The ayes have it. Well, welcome to Fauquier County. Okay, information items. Dr. Jack? There, there are two policies under number 11.A. Uh, um, there's, there's only one that will affect, potentially affect this board. 1-6.1 um, has to do with um, distance or electronic participation in a school board meeting. The board can now pass a policy whereby any board member who's absent can, for example, Skype in to the meeting and um, has the ability to vote. Uh, so the, the board has the uh, potential or the uh, authorization to pass such policy. The other piece is a, uh, is a, a tiebreaker. Uh, it just, and I don't, we don't do this in Falk here, but in the event that we had a appointed tiebreaker, 
In other words, if there was a, abs a member absent, there were four members, there was a tie. School boards have the ability to appoint a tiebreaker to break the tie. Mm -hmm. We don't do that. Um, all this policy does is uh, make that a required elected position instead of an appointed position. So the tiebreaker would actually have to participate in the general election and be elected just as school board members are. The good news is we don't need to worry about it because we don't do it in front of you. Yeah, really. Right. Okay. Good thing. The only thing I didn't understand is why it took out the majority vote for the um, the uh, allowing a person to Skype in. It said you could just pat. It took out by a majority vote. That was deleted out of the. I just don't understand why he took it out. I mean, how do you pass something if it's not by a majority? But we'll, we'll find that out before we yeah. actually vote, because yeah. we're not voting on this tonight, mm -hmm. is right. that right? Yeah, yeah, this is just informational. Well, if we could find out why that is, then I'd be good with it. Okay. Okay, any questions about any of that? Mm -mm. Okay, thank you. All right, Ms. Downs. Good evening. In front of you tonight to request the school board approve the revisions to personnel policies 5-3.2, tobacco-free schools, 5-7.6, employee absences, 5-8.2, office of the division superintendent, and the new policies 5-7.8, employee lactation support, 5-7.9, uniforms, 5-9.2, use of private cars for transportation students, um, for transporting students. 5-9.3, school bus privileges, and updates from alpha to numeric, 5-9.1, which is issues regarding employees and third party complaints, and 5-9.4, the whistleblower <laughs> protection policy. Uh, in front of you, the majority of the policies are the House and Senate that they passed for the 2014 General Assembly. But there are several policies that I'm requesting go to action tonight. The rest I'm asking for us to move to work session. Um, policy 5 7.6, employee at absences has two changes. The first one is eligibility for the sick leave bank. We're going to, effective July 1, new hires are eligible for the hybrid retirement services through VRS. And that serve, the hybrid has long-term and short-term disability. Therefore, they won't any longer need the sick leave bank. So that's the first change. The second change is the adoption of a bereavement leave statement in the policy. And we've made that bereavement leave um, in accordance with the county government policy. In addition, let's see, I think that's, I think that's it. Yes, questions about the policies? I mean, I, I will come to work session, but the, the two that, wasn't the other one? It's not on there, but uniform. I don't. Yes. Oh, okay. Well, I'm sorry. What? What's that? She yeah. said all of them to be approved on the 23rd. Okay. I, that can still work. Yeah, I thought, I thought we were just. I wanted the, the for just before the July 1st start right. date. So yes, the June. I'm sorry. Okay. So we're okay. We're not going to pass anything. We're not going to pass anything evening. tonight. Right. Okay. Yeah, I, I was just yeah. being anxious. It'll, it'll be, I'm, that's sorry. Fine. Yeah. I'm sorry. I'm <laughs> sorry. Right. Well, I just yeah. want to mention that all of these, the ones that you were talking about, specifically the changes to bereavement and, and leave and all that, you those were all discussed at our joint personnel and finance committee meeting, and the four board members present were supportive of those. They were really good changes. And that one did come as a suggestion from F the Teachers Association, so that's great. Okay, anything okay. else? Thank no. you. Twenty third is okay, right? The twenty third yeah. is okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, it'll, it'll it just has to be right. before July one. Yeah. Well, yeah, it'll, it'll be yeah. a work session and a special school board meeting, so we can go ahead right. and enact all right. the Okay, good, because that motion might have been too complex for us anyway. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was complex okay. for me to read. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Anything okay. else? Uh uh. Okay. VRS resolution. Yes, I'm just going to stay up here for the next couple. <laughs> yeah. um, okay, the following request that the school board adopt the resolution to elect employer contribution rates for the Fauquier County sp School Board. We also reviewed this in the Joint Personnel yeah. Finance Committee meeting. This is just adopting the um, rate 
that is established a certified rate of 6.47%. What will happen is once you adopt, then the Board of Supervisors on Thursday will do a concurrence resolution so we can send to BRS. Okay. Any questions? Mm -mm. Anything else? No, okay. we already we talked about this. Yeah, we talked the, about that also yeah. at the. Right, okay. we got that right. Yeah. We got that one. Yeah. All right. Sorry. <laughs> okay, well, this one's also complicated, so hopefully, Ginger's over here on my left going to help me keep me straight. Okay, the following request is that the school board approve the following position adjustments. The first one is an addition of a full time permanent human resources specialist. Um, number two is addition of one full-time permanent special education teacher and to get that teacher there will be two vacant special ed instructional assistants not filled to make the teacher. Right. Um, three, increased supervisor for advanced studies and fine arts position to, from two full-time so currently it's part-time and then finally to increase a part-time mental health specialist to full-time position. No? Uh, no? And, and, and these yeah, recommend yeah, that's right. Recommendations are being made, and we, we discuss it in great detail, and there's no financial impact that's uh, correct. To, to our current or future budget coming up. Yeah, but we don't have the mental health and the... Um, so that you can advertise it as full-time? Okay. Okay. Yeah. There's no budget impact on this. No budget right. impact. Right. Budget right. neutral. So these are excellent additions of personnel. These are mm -hmm. excellent. So we all support it. Okay. That sounds good. Okay. So do we have a motion? I move that the school board move information item 11C and the human resource specialist position and the adjustment of the advanced studies and fine arts supervisor positions full time from item 11D to action items 12A and 12B for consideration for approval this evening and renumber the remaining agenda items accordingly. Second. There's been a motion and a second that the school board move information item num and I know it sounds ridiculous that I read this again but it's actually in our rules that we have to do this so in case you're wondering why I do this. That the school board move information item number 11C and human resource and the human resource specialist position and the adjustment of the advanced studies and fine arts supervisor position to full time from item number 11D to action items number 12A and 12B for consideration for approval this evening and renumber the remaining agenda items accordingly. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say no. The ayes have it. Excellent. Okay, yep. Ms. Bourne. Yes, thank you. Um, before I start the agenda item that's up, I wanted to report that um, Cheryl Fisher, the Director of Transportation, um, informed me this afternoon that Daisy Girl Scout Troop number 554 selected the transportation office as their hometown heroes. This is um, drivers, aides, and staff this year and gave them boxes of cookies um, to thank them for their service. That's great. So I think they were very pleased at that and they now have wonderful cookies to We enjoy. still have cookies over there? Okay. <laughs> so, I, I'm sure you'll see Dr. Jack tomorrow. <laughs> That's great. Well deserved. Yes. Um, tonight, um, for your information, I have a presentation on the report on the automation system of the timekeeping for bus drivers and aides, transportation drivers and aides, they're not all buses, and what this means in calculating um, their pay for the upcoming school year. And also as part of this, um, we are requesting that you consider changing their leave policy to make it consistent for all drivers and that will be part of the presentation and I'll tell you what that means. Um, the piece that will need to go to action um, in July would be the piece on changing the leave policy. Um, I think that policy has been presented as part of your policies tonight. So I'm going to try to talk and move this. Um, information item. 
Um, this is a time and implementation plan for bus drivers, transportation drivers, and aides. And the goals in um, this uh, we um, are to implement the use of the time and attendance module that we purchased when we purchased the transportation management system. It does include time and attendance module, and it was approved by you at the time uh, that we purchased this about a year ago. And this time and attendance module will ensure that bus drivers and aides are paid accurately, and I should add to that timely as well. The back, a little bit of background. Um, bus drivers are classified employees as are other office workers, instructional aides, um, administrative assistants, and all classified employees are paid based on actual hours worked or they use approved leave. But bus drivers and aides have traditionally been paid um, currently based on um, estimated time and not actual time. Um, this has been a problem over the years, and some years ago this was changed. Um, Ms. Kotov, it was when she was here originally, it was changed to try to get a better handle on how we estimated time. Um, so we've tried to improve it over the years, but we don't pay them based on actual time, um, which becomes a little bit of a problem. Estimating time means we can't accurately determine if we're paying drivers correctly or even um, what their time is and how we're paying it. Uh, as a result, we often maybe overestimate, but even then we could be wrong because there's traffic accidents, they're you know, they get tied up in traffic, they have issues that come up um, when we have, they have to reroute because the road is closed. So there are a number of things that make this a problem in estimating time. Um, and then estimating time creates a legal liability for the school division un under the Fair Labor Standards Act. Um, as I said, the installation of this equipment, um, it began last summer um, when we purchased it and we finished it up in the early fall. Um, drivers and aides began using the system to become familiar with it, um, I believe in October 2013. Um, use of the time and attendance to pay drivers and aides will result in paying actual time, as I said. Um, data from the time and attendance system will be automated. Um, the time will be automated. It will eliminate errors in pay and delays that occur when we keep manual timesheets. So the advantages and disadvantages, um, some of these things will be, I've already mentioned, for example, it cap captures time to comply with the Fair Labor Standards Act. It eliminates time estimates. Um, it will, using actual time, will also allow us to offer um, the opportunity, will allow us to consider adding dual positions again. You know, we stopped having dual positions um, because we need to be sure that we are paying correctly under the Fair Labor Standards Act. And because we had manual um, systems, we couldn't be sure that we were capturing all the uh, time correctly with two different positions and two different supervisors. Now that we have a new payroll system, that helps us on one side of the house and then the time and assistance module helps us on the other side. So that will allow us to consider opening that option up again. And it also offers the opportunity to re revise the leave policy that I'll talk about in a moment. Um, it also automates the pay process. It captures time by entering a one or two digit code in a small piece of equipment that's um, installed in every vehicle that transports students. Um, it eliminates the paper timesheets, um, which means it also eliminates the ma manual entry of time into the payroll system um, from those manual timesheets. It improves the timeliness timeliness of pay because time is now entered into this um, software that transfers into um, the payroll system. And so all pay will be on time because a piece of paper got turned in late and so someone didn't get paid for the time when they should have. Um, it improves the accuracy of pay as I've mentioned and it increases the efficiency of staff. Um, 
And it may, since it pays for all-time work, it may result in increased pay for some. Now, I also have this on the disadvantaged side because it may result in a loss of, of a time for some. Um, and then it enhances the ability for the transportation to de department to manage overtime um, because they can capture it electronically and manage it better. Um, the disadvantages, it, it's a change. The disadvantage is that it's an unknown. Um, drivers um, will not be certain because it's not a system that they worked with. Um, and so they'll have a lot of questions as we work through this, as we do with any change. And we're just gonna have to work through it step by step with them. Um, right now, they're guaranteed route time based on estimates. Under the new system, they'll be paid actual route time. And as you'll see, this should be pretty close um, to what, um, what they're getting now, um, because I've got a couple of slides that show you the, the um, types of work that they're doing now are gonna be the same types of work. Um, it's just that if they do get in um, a traffic jam, they're still under the clock. They don't have to try to estimate what that is and then put in a miscellaneous timesheet. Um, and of course, as I said, it could result in some cases in a reduction in pay um, for some, uh, in, on some days. Um, pay earned may fluctuate somewhat from pay period to pay period. Um, I want to go through the pay calculations a little bit, just um, generally. Um, drivers and aides, and these are drivers and aides in authorized positions, this doesn't apply to substitutes who fill in. Um, they um, are paid for work, um, three types of work. Assigned route work, activity trips, which includes ac uh, both athletic and field trips, and what we call extra work, and it could be extra work on the bus, um, or it could be extra work off the bus. And the extra work on the bus are usually things that are not something that happens every day. For example, if we have a shuttle, like Governor's School, for example, that's included as route work. Um, the driver um, does their high school, middle school run. They get to the high school, drop the kids off, pick up the Governor's School. They shuttle them to Lord Fairfax, and then they go on the elementary run. So that's all included in their route time. So if we have things that happen every day, that's usually part of an authorized route. But if there are things that hap happen randomly, um, we've got um, students that go to um, um, refocus, it might not be every day, um, that is extra work, for example. And then there's work off the bus, which might be training, when we do the mandatory um, training, defensive driving, of the state required um, training at the beginning of both semesters. That's off the bus work, and we're trying to work out how we can get kiosks of these, um, this equipment that captures the time to automate that as well. But um, there are those things off the bus. They might meet with the principal or with um, staff in the transportation office to go over their route or have questions. And so we need to capture that time as well. Um, our goal is to be sure that we're paying them for everything that they work, um, not, not a minute less. We want to be sure that we're capturing all their time. Um, and all that pay will be paid using actual time. And now it's a combination of actual and estimated. And this shows that. You can see under the current method, they're, they're paid for their contract time, and that's the route time. Um, it's the estimated route time that we get from the routing software. Um, we add 60 minutes per day to each um, driver's route, and that's um, 10 minutes for their pre-trip at the beginning of the a.m. and the p.m., and five minutes for their post-trip. We add some lineup time because when they line up at the schools um, before kids are dismissed, um, that takes time. They, they're sitting there waiting for the kids to come out. And then um, there are other miscellaneous duties when they go to fuel their bus, say between routes or at the end of their route for their next day's route. Um, we are including that um, in some of their um, trip-related maintenance um, is included in that. Um, 
And so that's an hour every day. Activity trip time sheets currently are based on actual time because the drivers actually keep a, a manual paper sheet that says when they started, the time they started, and the time they ended. That's rounded and um, entered into the system. And then extra work is based on estimated time. Um, so they estimate how long it would take that job and whether the job takes longer or not, that's the time that's entered into the system. The new method uses actual time. The drivers, whenever they're on the bus, they're keying in a code for the different types of work they do. And so the system's going to capture that time. It eliminates the paperwork um, and it automatically will get pulled into the payroll system to pay them. Um, the only thing that we'll have paperwork for or until we get the, um, the trainings. We may have to um, have some miscellaneous timesheets until we get kiosks in place to electronically enter that time. But it will eliminate 90 or 95 percent of the paperwork. Um, the pay calculations, um, assigned route work pay will be calculated, as I said, current to um, current practice. So. Um, I'm going to go through a couple of slides that's going to show that. Um, let me go. In the, in the morning, the route time, the actual route time, the actual route will, time will begin and end as currently scheduled. Because I think there's some uncertainty as what does this mean um, when this, what the system will capture. At the parking location, which the drivers now, some, some of them, their parking locations are at their homes, some of them are at school. So um, when they get to their parking location, they log into the system. Um, they do their pre-trip inspection. They start their route. The route tells them what time they need to start their route. That's not going to be any different. They're still going to know what their route schedule is going to be. They perform their route. They drop the students off at their high school or middle school. They stay on, they stay logged into the system for the layover time or whatever. For some of them, they have more layover than others. Um, and then they begin their elementary route. Same as being done now. Um, they perform their elementary route, take their students to school, take their bus back to their parking location, whether it's at the school or their home, do their post-trip inspection, and log out of the system. That's what's happening now. That's what will happen um, with the new system. The only difference is we'll be paying them based on actual time, not what we think is happening. And since there are set times for the route, it should be fairly close to what um, they're actually doing now. And then there's a similar um, process in the afternoon um, same thing with leaving their parking location. The biggest difference in the afternoon is that there is lineup time included because they go to the school, they line up, and they have to get in line. So there's time that they're sitting at the school waiting before the students are dismissed. And so there's lineup time, um, particularly at the beginning of their first run, because they're on the layover as part of the lineup time for um, the elementary run. And then at the end of the day, they take their bus back to their parking location and they log out. So it's pretty similar to what's happening now. Um, they get the dr bus drivers have been on biweekly pay. This isn't anything new for them. So they'll continue to be paid biweekly. And as occurs now, they're go it's going to be spread over the entire year, as we do with um, teachers, with instructional aides. We pay them over 12 months instead of 10 months. And the system is going to smooth out their pay and calculate it over the 12 months. And that's what's happening now, and that will occur with the new system as well for their route time. Mm -hmm. Same thing that happens now. Their activity trips and extra work will be paid real time. It'll be paid for the two weeks um, pay that they work. And there again, that should be on time because in right now what happens sometimes is timesheets get turned in late and so it doesn't, they don't get it captured quickly enough. And you may know that when we changed to biweekly, we changed to biweekly because it took 
too long for drivers to get their money when we were paying them mm -hmm. monthly. It took them six weeks to get paid for their extra time. And so this will capture it real time and they'll get it every time um, in their two week schedule. Um, just VRS, as, we, as you know, we consider bus drivers full-time employees. When it comes to VRS, they do get a VRS benefit, and they get that for what we consider their regular route time. So for all the activities that are associated with their regular route, they get VRS calculated on that now. And that will continue to be the case. We're not changing um, the um, types of compensation that are eligible for VRS. Um, they're the same except one exception, that's the last item in this list, and that is the random drug testing. Um, we have not been including that um, as part of VRS pay. Um, we do require it as part of the job, and so when they come in and spend time for a random drug test that is required under our policy, um, we will consider that as part of VRS compensation. So that's, that is a change. Um, pay that's ineligible for VRS benefit is exactly what's ineligible now, and that's activity trips, extra work, and overtime, and that's the same um, for as other employees. Overtime's not typically considered a VRS um, eligible. And then the leave benefit. Right now, we consider bus drivers full-time employees in all respects except when it comes to leave. They get the full-time health benefit, they get VRS, um, and so if they're on an authorized route, they're considered a full-time employee. But leave, we treat them as a different, they, some of them are part-time and some of them are full-time. If they have a route that is estimated to be six hours or more, they're considered full-time, and so they get three days of personal leave and ten days of sick leave. If they have a route that is less than six hours, it could be five and a half or five and three quarters, we pay them one and a half days personal leave and five days sick leave. Um, and their routes change during the year. As their route time changes, now all of a sudden they move into this over six hours or the under six hours, and it's a, a nightmare in trying to keep the paperwork, and it's also an inequity in the leave that we're giving them. And so we are recommending with this change that we consider all bus drivers on authorized routes um, and our, our um, routes are four hours or more that they be given the benefit of a full-time leave. And their, um, their leave, their day, is based on whatever their route day is. If their route's a four-hour route, they get their days considered a four-hour day. Um, if it's an eight hour, if they work eight hours, they get an eight hour day. So um, it is equitable and we would recommend that you consider changing that policy to apply that to all bus drivers. Okay. And um, I've noted here, um, Ms. Kotov was wonderful in doing a calculation on what she estimated that cost would be and the cost for personal leave is under $3,000, and the cost for sick leave is under $8,000. And that's for all bus drivers. That's for all bus drivers. Okay. Um, some of them already get the, um, I, I, about a third of them, um, I think it's about a third, get um, over six hour routes, and so they already get the full benefit. About two thirds of them are under, and they would get the additional leave days. And then just the schedule, just um, we've already talked to the Personnel and Finance Committee at the joint meeting. Um, we are doing some work to look at what some pay impacts might be, um, and we're working with HR on pulling that information in, so we're still working on that. And then um, we will review that finally with the Personnel Committee in July, and we will bring the policy change to you in July for action. Uh, any questions? No, I think you answered everything for me. Anybody? No, that's great. Okay, so we will, um, if you want, if you, I don't know if you need to talk to, about the leave policy and work session or if we just bring that back to you in July, what is your preference? On? Yeah, okay, so the leave policy will be at the work session.
Yeah, why don't we do that just in okay. case something That'll comes up in the community. But it sounds great. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Ms. Bourne. Okay, action items. Madam Chair, I motion that the school board adopt a VRS resolution to elect employer contribution rates. There's been a motion and a second that the school board adopt the VRS resolution to elect a pro excuse me, to elect employer contribution rates. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say no. The ayes have it. Okay. I motion that the school board approve the addition of a human resource specialist position and the adjustment of the advanced studies and fine arts supervisor position to full time. There's been a motion and a second that the school board approve the addition of an HR specialist position and the adjustment of the advanced studies and fine arts supervisor position to full time. Is there any discussion? These yeah. are excellent. Yeah, it's great. great. These are excellent changes. Anything else? All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say no. The ayes have it. I'll move that the school board approve the FY15 amended unified scale. Second. There's been a motion and a second that the school board approve the FY15 amended unified scale. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say no. The ayes have it. And finally, <laughs> we have a motion to adjourn. Motion to move adjourn. Move to adjourn. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so moved. <laughs> all right. Thank